Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dave, Dave Ettery. I'm the, the co-founder and CEO of SpryFox. Um, and uh, we have a, a game called Alpha Bear that's been downloaded uh, just over 4 million times, uh, mostly in English-speaking countries. It's an English word puzzle game. Um, and we're here because uh, uh, we got an SBIR phase one grant from the Department of Education to prototype English learning uh, elements in the game. And then we just, just a couple months ago, give or take, we got the phase two grant to go ahead and take that all the way to the finish line. Um, so we're very happy about that and here to talk a little bit about that amongst other things. Uh, but first of all, let me just tell you very little bit about our company. Um, so we're seven years old. Uh, as of February, um, we started with two people, my, myself and my partner, Daniel Cook, uh, and now we're 17 full-time people. Totally bootstrapped, n uh, no investors or loans or anything like that. Basically just got started funding our work through work for hire and consulting and things like that, and then slowly, organically grew to our current size uh, with revenues from our games kind of funding that growth and deals with platforms, things like that. Um, we've built dozens of prototypes, like many dozens. And, uh, and we've launched 13 distinct games in this seven year period. And when I say 13 games, I don't mean just like a game plus ports to different uh, platforms. I mean, these are 13 wholly distinct games. And then if you add uh, ports, it's many more than 13. So not bad, 13 in seven years for a small company. Uh, totally virtual, all of our people work from home. Um, we have, in fact, we have five people in Seattle, including myself, and we only meet once a month for lunch because we don't want to exclude the rest of the company. So it really is a truly virtual studio. Um, and the way we function is we're all very, we, every project is made with a very small team, one or two engineers, uh, three at absolute most. That's considered like extremely large for us and we try to condense the time in which there's three engineers working on a game. Uh, one or two artists, you know, ha half-time designer, that sort of thing. And we'll have those teams iterating very rapidly on a game for anywhere from one to three years before it ships. And we'll have anywhere from, well, nowadays it's about four of those teams running concurrently at any given time on four totally different projects. So again, with just 17 people, that's a, that's a relatively small team size and relatively large number of projects. Um, so yeah, and um, so here's what we're here to talk about. Alphabet, just out of curiosity, so I know where my audience is at, like how many of y'all have played Alphabet? Could you just show your hands? Well, it looks like about a half of you, cool. Um, so Alphabet, like I said, uh, is downloaded about roughly a little over four million times, almost entirely in English-speaking countries like the US, UK, Canada, and Australia, because it, it's, it's not localized uh, for a variety of reasons. It just would be difficult to localize. Um, uh, you can see it here. I won't spend too much time talking about it because I'm about to show a video that will show more, but um, on the right side, you've got the core mechanic, which is there's letters on the board. You, when you use the letters to spell words, they turn into bears, and your goal is to try to make the biggest possible bear that you can because it's worth more points. Um, and on the left side, you can see that there's your bear collection. You actually collect bears as you're playing the game. They're adorable. Um, they have little bonuses that help you in the game. You can actually use them. Um, so that's it. Um, so Alpha let me Bear show, here's a video that we made for our SBR phase one. That has been played by millions of people of all ages and demographic backgrounds. Alpha Bear has also earned critical acclaim. It was awarded the first ever Standout Indie Award by Google in the 2016 Google Play Awards and was a runner-up for the Game Developer's Choice Awards for Best Mobile Game. In Alpha Bear, you spell words in order to create big bears. The more adjacent letters you can successfully use, the bigger those cute bears get. Players of Alpha Bear have self-reported that they feel the existing commercial version of Alpha Bear already has educational benefits, even though we never intended Alpha Bear to be an educational game. And with our Phase 1 SBIR award, We've added several more educational features. Using our Phase 1 funds, we have prototyped and tested numerous new educational features in Alphabet. For example, we now have a Morpheme of the Day feature that introduces players to morphemes and encourages them to spell words with those morphemes, including words that they may not be familiar with. We also reward players with bonus points for voluntarily engaging with certain grammar-related quizzes during the game. Players can also use a new in-game dictionary to look up the definition of words that they might randomly stumble upon in the course of gameplay. Alphabet works on mobile phones and tablets for both iOS and Android, as well as on any computer or Chromebook with a web browser. The game is fully cloud-based, so students can continue their progress at home or at school if they wish. The game is designed to keep them engaged for months, if not years. Our goal is to use our existing distribution networks to promote a new educational version of Alphabet directly to millions of students at home, as well as reaching students at schools through new distribution partners. Students can play at home or at school. Right now, teachers can integrate Alphabet into the classroom by incorporating the game's morpheme of the day into their lesson plan, but in phase two, we plan to add additional administrative tools that allow teachers to adapt the game to their specific learning objectives. 
The teachers who participated in our phase one tests and responded with feedback were all extremely positive. All of them reported that the game was educational, that students would benefit from engaging with it for weeks if not months, and that the game integrated well into their school day and their lesson plan. Our tests included four classes, ranging from the 4th to the 8th grade. In aggregate, 95% of our student testers reported that they would like to continue playing the game at school. 81% reported that they would voluntarily play the game at home. And 76% reported that they felt like they had learned something from the game. So that, there was a lot packed in that video. One thing I want to emphasize is that the reason we decided to do this project is because we had hundreds of people in our user reviews on Google Play and on iTunes uh, just say, hey, we, we think this game is really, uh, oh, I love this, it has educational benefits, I feel like I'm learning, whatever, and hundreds and hundreds of people, which was neat. And then we also had uh, teachers and librarians contacting us through our email support, our you know, support at spritefox.com, asking us if we could support them using it in schools and things like that. And what's interesting is that no one in the team actually thinks this game is educational. Like, no, nobody, none of us. I mean, we understand why someone would think that, but none of us actually believes that the current version of Alphabet is educational. And, and yet, we find it fascinating that other people do. And so what we dis this is one of the main reasons we decided to go ahead and ask uh, the Department of Education for money to make it educational, because from our perspective, one of the hardest things that you can do is try to make a fun, highly original game. I mean, we were very well known for it in the game industry. We've got, I think, five games at this point that have all been downloaded by several million, millions of people. So we're, we're considered one of the more successful indies in this space. And yet, two out of every th three games that we release is a commercial failure. Um, so it's hard enough making a really original, really fun game that does well in the market. And then if on top of that you try to make it educational and appeal to students and also somehow work for teachers so they feel comfortable bringing it into a classroom environment, like you've added so much risk to the project that it's almost incredibly, you know, it's almost guaranteed to fail. And I think, frankly, that the history of the educational game space has, has borne that out, right? I'm not saying anything controversial here. Whereas if you, uh, here we have a game that has already been downloaded by millions of people. We know it has excellent, re excellent retention. We know it's fun. And we have teachers and, and regular players proactively telling us that they think it's educational. So even though I don't actually believe them, I don't think it's educational, they have clearly signaled that they're receptive to it. And so we have a chance to basically start from a really good place and get a head start. Um, so that's what we're doing. Um, but the interesting thing is we're treating this game as a, um, as a, as essentially as a new game, even though we have that existing game as a foundation. The prototyping that we did, we, we did it the same way we do prototyping in any other project, you know, rapidly iterating with one or two engineers, um, you know, over a, port, a period of a few months. Um, the full game that we're making based on Alphabet One that will be educational is we're giving it as much time, actually probably more time than the original version of Alphabet, even though we already have the original version of Alphabet to build off of, because we're assuming that making those educational features and keeping the game fun and making the game an effective educational tool will be so hard that it might as well be like making an entirely new game. Um, that is our attitude about this. I think it's a relatively safe attitude for a self-funded, uh, you know, scrappy company like ours. If we had tons of money coming from some other source, maybe it would be different. And we do have some money from the Department of Education, but I still think even with that support, we have to be conservative. And so that's what we're doing. Um, so, okay, so I've talked a lot at various, now we can finally get to the point of the slide that's actually on the screen. Um, I've talked a lot about like our, our focus on rapid iteration. Let me spend just a little bit of time explaining what we mean by that. So here's how we approach rapid iteration. Um, we'll decide where we wanna go, and then once we've decided where we wanna go, we break it into very short-term designs. Like, hey, what can an engineer or two engineers build in the next few hours, like literally hours to a day, at worst case, a, a few days, that we can then test and see if it's fun or not. Got that? Everyone agrees on it? Okay, great, build it. And when I say build it, I mean build it in the most bare bones way possible. And other, it, many times we won't even let artists touch a project at the, in the earliest phases. And that's for a variety of reasons. The main one being that, first of all, art is expensive. And second of all, oftentimes when you put art into an early prototype, you end up falling in love with the art because it's so pretty and it blinds you to the fact that the prototype itself is fundamentally flawed and you find yourself making very bad decisions. Being like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, no, yeah, nobody's having fun, but this is so gorgeous. Clearly we can find some way to make it work. I mean, I'm sure there's something out there and then you end up iterating forever on something that would be best shit canned, you know, to be blunt. Um, so we, uh, so we, we build it as quickly as we can with engineers, placeholder art or you know, programmer art. Um, play test that after that. And play testing is initially, of course, just us internally. 
but very soon after, uh, we play, you know, as soon as we think there's anything there, we'll start to get friends and strangers to play. Ideally strangers, because their fresh eyes and their lack of bias is really important. Um, and we'll actually use, even for something that's targeted at children, we'll initially use commercial services like usertesting.com to do the testing, even though user testing only has adult volunteers. Because what we found is, if an adult is struggling with your game, then a kid almost certainly, I mean, if you find a 20-year-old gamer and they can't play your game, odds are an eight-year-old gamer won't be able to play it either, right? So, so they're still very useful, even though it's not exactly the same target audience. And services like user testing are great. I mean, you get a video that shows you exactly where the player was tapping. They vocalize what they're thinking as they're playing. You can ask them to fill out surveys at the end. Super, super useful testing tool, tool, particularly for a virtual studio that doesn't, like we don't have an office. We don't have anywhere where we can do focus groups. Um, we, I will oftentimes do them in like coffee shops in, in an impromptu fashion because I have no other choice. So, um, so we'll play test with strangers. And then after we've done the play test, we analyze the issues. Like did we see really fun things in the, uh, in the play test? Are people really enjoying and can we amplify that fun? Are there parts of the game that didn't seem to be working that we could just cut whole cloth? Uh, and if not, you know, how do we refine them? And then we just repeat that hour after hour, day after day, until we get to the point where we can say, this is worth investing in, or this is something we should kill. And unfortunately, that decision, the, the process of making that decision could fill up a 20 minute lecture all by itself, so I'm not gonna be able to talk about it now. Um, but suffice to say, AlphaBear did reach that point where we said, okay, great. After a few months, we were really happy with the direction it was going, the AlphaBear Educational Edition, I should say, and we're willing to apply for the phase two grant. Uh, and we did, and we just recently got it. Um, so let me show you a little bit um, some of the stuff that we prototyped in that first phase one uh, three month period. One of the things we, we prototyped was simply making it possible for people to get the definitions of words that they're entering into the game. And you might ask, why is that necessary? If someone is entering a word into the game, doesn't that by definition mean that they're familiar with the word? And the answer is, yeah, they might be familiar with it, um, but they may not know what it actually means. And in some cases, they're not even familiar with it. So one thing we observed in these play tests that we do so often is that particularly in, in Alphabear, you'll find situations where someone is desperate to use a certain set of letters because it would maximize the size of their bear. And so in some cases, they'll go so far as to literally just start mashing in letters in random combinations, hoping to stumble on a word that, um, that, that is actually a valid word. And, and that happens more often than you'd think. And so we were like, hey, they're like literally randomly stumbling on words. We should at least take the opportunity to tell them what those words mean. You'll also see less extreme, very frequently less extreme versions of that where someone is vaguely familiar with the word, they may have seen it once or twice, they like, oh, I think this is a word, but I'm not sure what it means, and they enter it, and so again, that's an opportunity for us to educate them. We can also give them hints, like when they get stuck, and the hint can be a great appropriate word that they may not be familiar with, um, and again, because they're not familiar with it, it's an opportunity to teach them. So we put this, um, this live definition, and by the way, this actually looks very nice, um, just so you understand, in, our, in the prototyping we did, again, no art. So it was literally just totally programmer art. We had this super ugly dictionary button, and then if you clicked it, this black and white text would, you know, screen would pop up with absolutely no art in it, just giving you the definition. That worked really well, people seemed to like it, so this is actually a more recent iteration of this dictionary feature that uh, is gonna be appearing in the PC version of Alphabet, which is shipping very soon. Um, but yeah, so this is one thing that we thought was a, a small win that we could easily get into the game. Um, we also had, uh, it's not skipping forward. Um, well, actually, let me first talk about this because it's probably going to autoplay the instant I go over. We also uh, pr uh, prototype these procedurally generated quizzes, and they're vocab they're like antonyms, synonyms, vocabulary quizzes, parts of speech quizzes, and we wanted to see, like, even though a quiz is kind of a gross thing to put in a game, chocolate covered broccoli, we wanted to see if we could implement it in a way that like would actually potentially seem fun, um, and so we put them into the game, um, and you can see here one of the reasons I want to show you these quizzes is because. Uh, you can see here a video that we got back from usertesting.com. So for those of you who haven't used it, you'll see how darn useful it is. Um, you'll also get a chance to get a laugh and see what happens when you make a procedurally generated vocabulary quiz and forget to filter the dictionary before doing it. And, uh, what is this? All right, random quiz. Shit. Oh, yes, a course term for defecation. One. Uh... Um, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to say too much more about the procedure that generated quizzes, other than to say that I still really worry that they're too much like chocolate-covered chocolate broccoli. They probably won't make it into the final version of the game, even though all of our testers told us that they either didn't mind them or liked them. Um, I'm just afraid that they might send too strong a signal about uh, what this game is, and i.e., 
you know, educational game. You will learn as opposed to you will have fun. Um, the last and most important feature that we prototype is this thing called the morpheme of the day. It won't be called mighty, mighty morpheme power tip of the day. That was just us being silly. Um, and the way it works is every day there's a morpheme, like ing, or in this case od, and it'll tell you what the, the morpheme typically means, and it'll give you example words that incorporate that morpheme. And then every time you play the, the game that day, if you happen to spell a word that incorporates that morpheme, you'll get bonus points. And not only will you get bonus points, but when you spell the word, it pops up and it's like, yay, you got bonus points. And by the way, just in case you forgot, this is what this morpheme means. And by the way, in case you didn't know, this is the definition of the word that you just spelled. Because oftentimes, again, they'll just enter in words that they're not even sh totally familiar with. Um, because they're trying to get points. And this is really nice because we can make the example words that we provide them great appropriate things that they're supposed to learn this year. Um, morphemes, by the way, for those of you who aren't familiar with English learning, they are like apparently the new hotness in uh, English learning in general. We were told by all the professors who are advising us that it was really, really important that we focus on this because it's an important way for people to learn English. So this is yet another thing we've prototyped that will almost certainly appear in the final game in some fashion, but not looking like that because again, that's programmer art that we jammed out as quickly as we conceivably could. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about um, is in some ways the most important thing. If you're familiar with Alphabet at all, that you're then you're familiar with this. Um, at the end of every game, we take words that you spelled in the game and we randomly pop them into templates and we've written dozens of templates. Um, and oftentimes the results are hysterical. We don't have, there's no intelligence to it. It's completely random. We just happen to know that, you know, we, we know what words are nouns and what noun, words are verbs and so on and so forth. And so we just randomly take things that we know as a noun and we plug it into a spot for a noun. And you end up with something like this where, you know, I've been using leafy steeds lotion on my hands. It makes them soft. Leafy steeds are words that the player entered. Um, this is super powerful part of the game. This is probably the thing that Alphabet is most famous for. It has it has a huge impact on our retention. It made the game really viral in a way games rarely are nowadays. Um, and uh, it's an important part. And as you can imagine, um, sometimes people find ways to do lewd things with this feature. So here's four different uh, Mad Libs that I randomly scraped from Twitter using the Alphabet hashtag. Um, as you notice, uh, even though none of them are using bad words, they all have, uh, they're all you know a little bit transgressive, a little bit titillating. Um, this, I, I, I think is actually, I, I'm not just putting up this, this up to make you laugh, although I fully admit I'm partially doing it for that reason. Um, I, I'm putting these up here because I think this little bit of transgressiveness is actually a really important feature of the game and will be an important feature of the game when, it's, uh, when there's an educational version uh, as opposed to a bug. Um, I think that educational games have a really, I mean, again, I don't think this is a particularly controversial statement. Educational games have a really bad reputation. Right? They, if you grew up with them like I did, the earliest versions of them, you think of Math Blaster, or at best you think of Oregon Trail, which, which let's face it, wasn't actually all that educational. Um, if you're a younger person, maybe you have encountered a few better examples, but in general, someone says to you educational game, and you assume something that maybe isn't all that educational and almost certainly isn't all that fun. Um, and so we understand that that's the space we're jumping into, that there's this level of cynicism that we have to combat. And I'm not sure there's any better way to combat it than something like this, right? I imagine some student sitting in class being like, oh, I've got to play another educational game. And next thing you know, they realize that they can make your teeny athlete is so impressive in the game. And they giggle to themselves, and they think they're being clever and transgressive. And, and, and as if this is any different than Mad Libs, which I don't know how many of you guys have done Mad Libs, particularly when you were younger. But when I was an eight-year-old boy doing Mad Libs, I literally, it was just an exercise in writing as many potty words as I could. Right? Like that's, that's what Mad Libs is to 99% of people who play them when they're kids. Um, so this is not a big deal. There's nothing particularly wrong with it. But that slight la layer of transgressiveness is, I think, something that, um, that can really help us counteract uh, the stigma that educational games have in the classroom and hopefully get students to be a little bit more willing to play the game and to treat it like something that they actually would might want to play and to share it with their friends and so on and so forth. So um, anyway, but that's not the only reason we're excited about bear speech. Here is a screenshot of something we already have in the game. It's versus mode, where two people actually make a Mad Lib together. The person on the left makes one, and the person on the right then makes an answering Mad Lib. And we've realized that we can, hopefully, in, Alpha, in the educational version of Alphabet, we can turn this into a whole story, right? We can have a string of these, where you're basically co-authoring 
uh, um, a Mad Lib together with a lot of other people and hopefully working on your learning comprehension in the process. Uh, and on top of that, it doesn't have to all be random. Like instead of just us randomly taking nouns and verbs and whatnot and plugging them into the templates, we can change this so that here in the screen sheet, screenshot, you would see it say, I like my singular noun, like I like, like my coffee, Adjective, right? And then the player taps on the singular noun or taps on the adjective, and all the words that they entered previously into the game pop up. But we don't tell them which one's the noun and which, you know, which one's the noun and which one's not. And then they tap on something. And if they tap on the wrong thing, we tell them, sorry, the word you tapped on is a verb. Here's how you should, know, should have known it was a verb. And then we give them another chance. And okay, this time they tapped on the singular noun and it gets populated. And so in this way, they'd be learning about parts of speech in a hopefully really engaging context, far more engaging than they might in any given classroom situation. So we're really excited about the bare speech uh, component of this, partially because we think it will help us combat some of the more negative stereotypes, and partially because we actually think it's a really no novel way to tackle uh, teaching parts of speech and, and reading comprehension and that sort of thing. And that's all I have time for. Um, uh, uh, I, if you have any questions about any of this, we're a super open company. We're, I, I like to think we're one of the most open companies out there. If you want, have any questions about uh, the business of Alphabet, you're welcome to, to ping me. Uh, I'm David at spryfox.com. If you have any questions about our prototyping processes, things I mentioned and didn't mention, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to talk. Um, thank you very much.